Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic. I remember it so you don't have to. And welcome to Star Trek Month. Engage review. Yes, yeah, sir. What can you say about Star Trek? Well, really, everything. It's a great vehicle for creative ideas. It's an onslaught of cliched writing. Its characters are timeless and unforgettable. Their personalities are on par with the Ninja Turtles. It's one of the greatest works in sci-fi of all time. It's the corniest schlock you'll ever watch. Everybody has an opinion on Star Trek, but there is one pattern that most people seem to agree on. When it comes to the movies, the even-numbered ones seem to be the best. For whatever reason, the odd-numbered Star Trek films seem to be the ones that get once-in-a-while viewers and die-hard fans really pissed off. I believe we can attribute that to the binary structure that emanates from these movies. Or it could just be a giant coincidence. Damn it! I almost said it in tenement gent! So all throughout January, we're going to look at the odd-numbered Star Trek movies. The ones that seem to get Trekkies panties in a bundle. And we're going to start off with Star Trek The Motion Picture. Roll clip number one. Energize! I cannot dedicate it! I don't have the power! Or the, uh, <clears throat> many... Thank you! So we see our opening credits. We got William Shatner, Leonard Nimoy, DeForest Kelly, and the rest! We then cut to some sort of anomaly in space, where the Klingons come to check it out. Well, wait a minute. In the original show, the Klingons have flatheads. Well, now they're all round and pointy? What's up with that? Incoming cameo critic! Oh, God, I was hoping I could avoid this. No choice, I have to face the music. Put him on screen. Hi, critic. Angry Joe? Oh, thank God. I thought you were like Kara for a second. <laughs> yeah, I know. He's obsessed with Star Trek. He's a total geek. <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> so anyway, I wanted to point out why exactly the Klingons' heads look like that. You see, there's actually several different theories that's popped up over the years. Uh, the first one being that the Klingons uh, suffer from the Nechrat, which is a degenerative disease that uh, only their species suffers from. Ah, uh, yeah, look, uh, when I asked that question, I was only half curious. Well, not even half, a third. The, fifth. the fans would kill me if I didn't bring it up, so you don't need to explain it. But, but, but surely you need a Star Trek expert like me to help you through this. No, I don't. And we're not going to do that thing where we go back and forth and then suddenly I give in. I'm doing it alone. But, but Critic, you have no idea what you're in for. Oh, come on. It was directed by Robert Wise, one of the greatest directors of all time. I'm sure I can get through this. Very well, Critic. Very well. But do you know the ancient Klingon proverb that tells us Revenge. Nope, I'm not allowing any quotes either. Just piss off. Oh, but come on! I've been wanting to do this speech for years! Engage over dubbing audio! Right! Hello, I am Angry Joe, the fastest mouse in all Mexico. I like to yell and scream because I'm a stupid head and like to drink elephant urine. I have no friends, only my elephant urine. Does this incredibly racist accent offend you? Good! I don't even think it's the right nationality. That'll teach you next time to interrupt my review. Nicely done. Now back to the review. Engage! You know, you don't have to point every time you see that. <laughs> Fine. So in typical Klingon fashion, if they don't know what something is, they shoot it! <laughs> oh yeah, I should probably mention this anomaly always seems to make what I guess is supposed to be a disturbing sound, but it always sounds like a chord off of an electric guitar. Excellent! But the anomaly doesn't like that, and fries them faster than... Oh, I don't know, a cheap Vulcan replacement for Spock. Oh, hey, look! A cheap Vulcan replacement for Spock! ...report to you, sir. It is my intention to be on that ship following that meeting. Report to me in one hour. Mm, I give him two more lines before he finally kicks the bucket. Wow! I hope you paid that actor by the word, because he must have been pissed. And where is the real Spock, you may ask? He's on the planet Vulcan, about to partake in a ceremony that'll totally wipe out his emotions. But he senses the anomaly and finds he suddenly can't go through it. So she mind melds with him and finds that his brain is still filled with the most illogical of human remains. In the 
middle of the earth in the land of Shire lives a brave little hobbit whom we all admire. Bilbo, Bilbo Baggins, he's only three feet tall. Ugh, so illogical. But we then see Captain Kirk getting ready to board the Enterprise once again. Traditional Star Trek music and imagery. Get you right here, man. Yeah, that's still the ship. Still looking at the ship. Supposed to be counting the windows on this thing? Get a move on! Oh, uh, let me guess. The next two shots are gonna be Kirk reacting and a shot of the ship. I must be psychic! Well, thank God, it looks like they finally run out of space to go- Oh no! That was just the build-up for the front of the ship! Oh, that's great. And how much time are we gonna spend looking at the front of the ship? Fuck that noise! Prepare to fast forward! Preparing to fast forward! Fast forward! Fast forwarding, sir! Go past, go past this part! In fact, never play this again! Thank you, Mr. Scott. Aye, right, sir. Thank you, Mr. Bum. Aye, sir. But it turns out not everything on the ship is boringly pleasant. For it seems Kirk is relieving Captain Decker of his duty. For no other reason than, well, he wants to do it. I'm replacing you as captain of the Enterprise. May I ask why? My familiarity with the Enterprise. This is an almost totally new Enterprise. You don't know her a tenth as well as I do. That's why you're staying aboard. I'm sorry, Will. You told me how envious you were and how much you hoped you'd find a way to get a Starship Command again. It could be worse. You could be demoted to religious propaganda on the WB. But more bad news happens as it turns out the beaming of Mr. Not Spock is going awry. Gee, I wonder what's going to happen to him. Give it to me. Uh, yeah. Let the captain, who we've just been told doesn't know one-tenth of the ship, take away control from the person who's been trained specifically for this job. We got back didn't live long, fortunately. Well, good one, Kirk. You've been in charge for only 120 seconds, and you've already caused two casualties. It's gonna equal out to, what, a death a minute? And it's such a weird scene, too. Why have this character if all you were gonna do is kill him off? It's a grim, pointless scene. It's like watching My Little Pony and then just throwing in a horse exploding. I mean, why do we need that? Oh well, battlefield promotion. I'm afraid you're gonna have to double as science officer. Hey, keep it up and maybe one day you'll make Captain... <laughs> we then get the only crew member to have less hair than Shatner, Lieutenant Ilea. Hello, Ilea. Decker. I was stationed on the Lieutenant's home planet some years ago. Commander Decker? Yes, our exec and science officer. Captain Kirk has the utmost confidence in me. And then you too, Lieutenant. My oath of celibacy is on record, Captain. <laughs> oh, I was this close to spitting out my drink. What the hell?! As if this setup wasn't awkward enough, you really had to throw that in? Get some social skills, lady! My oath of celibacy is on record, Captain. Anyway, how is your sex life? But we still got one other crew member to welcome aboard, Bones. And if you think all the other people in this movie were dressed ridiculously, we need to get a load of this getup. A man who swore he'd never return to Starfleet. Just a moment, Captain, sir. They drafted me. Bones is a thing out there. Why is any object we don't understand always called a thing? Why can't it be called a who's it or a what's it? So the ship is all ready to go to stop the evil anomaly before it reaches Earth. Take us out. Uh, a 
little faster than that, please. Oh god, this is gonna take another hour, isn't it? You're not 2001, a space odyssey, okay? The Lord knows I love for the computer to wipe out most of the crew if possible. That was the action scene in the middle of the picture! I guess they thought they needed a little bit more excitement during this moment, so they threw in a guy nearly missing a door. Well, good to know you have your thrilling cutaway shot if you need it. Engineering, stand by for warp drive. Captain, we need further warp simulation on the flow sensors. Engineer, we need warp speed now. It's borderline on the simulator, Captain. I cannot guarantee that she'll hold up. Eh, yeah, fuck danger. The Captain wants warp drive and he wants it now. They enter through the opening of Vertigo when suddenly they realize, what a shock, something's gone wrong. Wormhole effect! I've identified a small object. Has been pulled into the wormhole that I've captained directly ahead. Orders are full. Continue shaking the camera and increase Photoshop smudge! Time to impact. 20 seconds. Vampire phasers. No! Delay that phaser order! Hey, sir, listen to this! I am your father! It turns out there's an asteroid that's about to hit them in warp, but Decker figures out how to save the day. So, just to clarify, Kirk's been in charge for only a few hours, and he's already killed two crew members and nearly wiped out the entire ship. I'd follow this man to eternal death. Mostly because I would have no choice. Mr. Scott, we need warp drive as soon as possible. Captain, it was the engine imbalance that created the wormhole in the first place. It'll happen again if we don't correct it. That object is less than two days away from Earth. We need to intercept while it still is out there. Need I remind you of the holy shit you nearly killed us moment not a few minutes ago? What? Why was my phaser order countermanded? Sir, the Enterprise redesign increases phaser power by channeling it through the main engines. The phasers were automatically cut off. Then you acted properly, of course. Captain Decker is right. I mean, Captain Decker. I mean, Captain Decker. I mean, he's the fucking captain. I don't know why Kirk is there. I'm sorry if I embarrassed you. You saved the ship. I'm aware of that, sir. Stop competing with me, Decker. Which means stop pointing out when I'm obviously wrong. But it turns out even Decker can fall victim to certain weaknesses, like cheesy romantic past dialogues. Was it difficult? About as difficult as seeing you again. I'm sorry. That you left Delta for? Or that you didn't even say goodbye? If I had seen you again, would you have been able to say it? get our last addition to the crew, Mr. Spock comes aboard to figure out why he's been sensing the anomaly. I offer my services as science officer. If our exec has no objections, of course not. So we now have a doubly demoted Decker, and Kirk is overjoyed because now he can partake in all the various over-the-top ways he can say Spock's name. Spock. 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 Oh, turns out I've been saying it wrong the whole time. It isn't Spock, it's Spock. But things heat up when they finally come across the evil anomaly. Full mag on viewer. Full mag, sir. Continuing friendship messages on all frequencies, sir. But because they figure out the frequency in which to communicate, the anomaly lets them get closer and eventually enter. And yes, this results in slow, 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 slow. Good God, this is just watching a bunch of footage and then seeing somebody comment on it! Who the hell would want to see that?! Oh, jeez! 
Jesus, it just keeps going! Do something, damn it! Fire a laser or some shit! Maybe if we try putting in a thrilling action sequence. Nope, it's still boring! Please do something! Tell a joke! Pull Spock's ears off! I don't care! Just something! Good God, they don't even bother with reactions anymore! They just are showing longer and longer shots with no friggin' edits in them whatsoever! CUT TO SOMETHING! CUT! 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 Oh my god! This is agony! This is such boredom! Angry Joe, why didn't you tell me? Tell me there's an edit coming up! These shots are going on forever! Please, give me a cut! Just give me a cut! Oh, I've done far worse than give you no cuts. I've hurt you. And I wish to go on hurting you. I shall leave you as this movie left me. Left all audiences. Marooned in the center of a dead screening. Born out of your mind. Born out of your mind. Believe it or not, something does finally happen! Oh, thank God's milky prostitutes! A probe comes aboard and starts taking control of the computer. Well, obviously Spock will find the most logical solution at the or he'll go Neanderthal on its ass. Spock smash! Oh, Spock no like to shiny thing! It then takes control of Ilea and vanishes her into thin air. Well, she's dead now. Tell me, was she celibate? But she shows up later on the ship, having been taken over by the anomaly. Jim, what's going on? Tricorder. No, that's a bald woman. But this is a tricorder. Jim, this is a mechanism. To more readily communicate with the carbon-based units infesting Enterprise. I'm programmed to observe and record. Wow, no emotions, no feelings, no needs? Yeah. It's the perfect woman! Ah! Am I wrong, ladies? Am I wrong? Ow. Oh. So the anomaly is called V'ger, and it's searching for who or whatever created her so that she may finally join with it. So while Decker shows her around the ship, allowing her to collect data, Spock surprisingly steals one of the space suits to see if he can communicate further with V'ger. Computer commence recording. Captain Kirk. These messages will detail my attempt to contact the aliens. So, to put it bluntly, he'll be back after these messages. No, wait, wait, that was a joke, that was a joke, I wasn't serious! No, hey, what are you doing? Stop! <sighs> Just a report! We were intercepted by a word from our sponsor! Damn it! Those advertising executives are getting more and more clever. Raise our shields against any more commercial plugs! Yes, sir! Incidentally, this raising of the shields is brought to you by the delicious taste of Diet Coke. Just her! Sorry, sorry! So Spock journeys to the center of V'ger and comes across... Well, there's no subtle way to say it. V'ger's vagina. A V'gerna, if you will. I mean, God, look at that! I keep thinking I'm gonna have to put a sensor bar over that thing! First we got the sky gina in Langoliers, and now we got the space gina in Star Trek! It's almost as if sci-fi writers don't get a lot of pussy! But that'd be ridiculous. Just look at this last picture of Phil K. Dick. Whew! Guy's a man whore. Spock tries to mind meld with V'ger, but gets his ass handed to him. He returns to the ship to report that V'ger came from a planet populated by living machines, and has evolved with incredible knowledge all except for one question, who the creator is. And V'ger vows to cure the universe of carbon units, mostly the ones on Earth, until she finds her answer. The carbon unit infestation is to be removed from the creator's planet. V'ger is a child, evolving. Learning. Searching. I suggest you treat her as such. 
Hey, does V'ger want to go to Chuck E. Cheese? Does V'ger want to see a Justin Bieber concert? Does V'ger want to fund a franchise about a sparkling vampire that's setting women back dozens of years? The carbon units know why the creator has not responded. Disclose the information. Not until V'ger withdraws the devices orbiting the third planet. So Kirk says he'll give the information, but only to the center of V'ger herself. The probe complies, and Kirk plans his next move. Mr. Scott, be prepared to execute Starfleet Order 2005. Why has the captain ordered self-destruct, sir? I would say last because he thinks, he hopes, that when we go up, we'll take the intruder with us. Uh, 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 I signed up for Starfleet to pay for my college. Uh, is there any chance we can not blow up on my very first mission? So how powerful is the emotional need at the center of V'ger? Well, apparently it's so powerful, it made Spock cry. Not for us. No, Captain, not for us. For V'ger. I weep for V'ger as I would for a brother. The brother that we find out you have later and clearly did not weep for, but one movie at a time. So they get to the center of V'ger and find out that V'ger is in fact Voyager. Voyager 6, the satellite that was sent out years ago and got sucked into a wormhole, landing it on the machine planet. It evolved over the years, and now it wishes to still somehow join with its creator. You mean this machine wants to physically join with a human? Is that possible? Let's find out. Decker, I'm gonna key the final sequence through the ground test computer. So, whatever he just says apparently means that Decker is giving himself to the computer. Oh my. So their joining sets off a giant explosion and Enterprise gets the hell out of there. Did we just see the beginning of a new life form? Yes, Captain. We witnessed a birth. Possibly a next step in our evolution. Well, let's never reference this big step in evolution again in anything Star Trek related. That way it'll show just what an impact it had on our evolution. Truly, this is a big day. That away. So the crew is back in form, they're happy a big bang was set off by a big bang, and they go off to where no man has gone before. And that was the first Star Trek movie, and let me tell you, I can see why it's often called the slow motion picture. The ideas are interesting, even provocative, but most of the characters aren't developed in an interesting way, the pacing is unbelievably slow, and on top of that, IT'S SO BORING! The effects, I'll admit, are very impressive, but when you have to look at them for what feels like an eternity, you get sick of them pretty fast. I really feel like this film was trying to do what 2001 A Space Odyssey did. You know, sort of make it like an experience movie. But that's not what Star Trek was mostly about. It was more about a mix of ideas and characters, not as much an out-of-body experience. The only out-of-body experience this movie can conjure is taking us to fucking dreamland. So, take it for what it's worth. I'm the Nostalgia Critic, and Star Trek Month is on the way! My oath of celibacy is on record.